Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Nell Pepper, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am delighted to introduce this virtual event with Matthew O'Coin presenting his new book, The Impossible Art, Adventures in Opera, in conversation with Garth Greenwell. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. I hope you're all well and safe. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our ever-expanding community. And uh, to learn more about upcoming events from here on our Zoom account or this year's Holiday 100 titles and other bookstore news, please check out our website at harvard.com. And while you're there, you can sign up for our email newsletter for more updates. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, you can click on the Q&A button on your screen and we will get through as many as time allows. This event will have closed captioning available as well. Depending on the version of Zoom that you are using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase copies of The Impossible Art on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of the series and of our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore in Harvard Square. We thank you so much for continuing to show up and support not only our authors, but also the truly fantastic staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. Of course, we hope that they don't, but if they do, we will do our best to resolve them quickly. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. And now I am so pleased to introduce our speakers. Matthew O'Coin is an American composer, conductor, writer and pianist and a MacArthur Fellow. He has worked as a composer and conductor with the Metropolitan Opera, Lyric Opera of Chicago, American Repertory Theater, Los Angeles Philharmonic, and the Music Academy of the West. He was the Los Angeles Opera's artist in residence from 2016 to 2020 and is a co-founder of the American Modern Opera Company. Garth Greenwell is the author of What Belongs to You, which won the British Book Award for debut of the year, was long listed for the National Book Award, and was a finalist for six other awards, including the Penn Faulkner Award and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. Greenwell's fiction has appeared in The New Yorker, The Paris Review, A Public Space, and Vice, and he has written criticism for the London Review of Books and New York Times Book Review, among other publications. His latest book, Cleanness, was long listed for the Pre Sod 2021, the Joyce Carol Oates Prize, and the Gordon Byrne Prize. Tonight, they will be discussing Matthew O'Coin's new book, The Impossible Art, Adventures in Opera. He calls opera the impossible art because since its inception, its goals have been completely unreasonable. Its earliest practitioners were trying to revive the style and power of ancient Greek drama, even though no one knows whether they were trying, whether those dramas were sung through, or in fact, whether they were sung at all through four subsequent centuries from Mozart to Stravinsky to Thomas Adez, opera composers have striven to fuse multiple art forms into one synesthetic experience that will transport its audiences out of the mundane. O'Coin illuminates the symbiotic relationship between composers and librettists and also tells the story of his new opera, Eurydice, which made its Metropolitan Opera debut November 23rd and has three more performances this month, FYI. So, you know, if you're available. <laughs> I'm thrilled to turn things over to our new speakers. Uh, the digital podium is yours, Matthew and Garth. And first, I'm going to turn things over to Matthew. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction, Nell. And I want to second that supporting the Harvard Bookstore is uh, always 
a good thing to do in our world. Um, before Garth and I dive into conversation, I'm going to read a short excerpt from uh, the book's introduction in which I talk about opera as kind of its own planet, uh, one uh, with a slightly different gravitational field and different atmosphere from, from Earth. So this is the section about opera's laws of gravity. Opera is governed by strict, unwritten, irrational laws. These laws are diabolically hard to predict or pin down, but they enforce themselves implacably, like the edicts of the Queen of Hearts in Alice in Wonderland. I think these laws are best articulated as reversals, reversals between what works in life and what works on stage, between communication through speech and through song. Opera's first law of gravity, the external is the internal. Opera is a highly extroverted art form, sometimes grotesquely so, but what we perceive as abundant exteriority is always the manifestation of an inner state, whether individual or collective. There is no such thing as objectivity in opera. We are always inside someone's head, either in individuals or crowds. Total objectivity is surely impossible in other media too, but opera composers, unlike say documentary filmmakers, never had a prayer of creating the illusion of objectivity in the first place. This is both a constraint and a liberation. Opera's second law of gravity. In opera, all speech is dream speech, whether it wants to be or not. The dreamlike and the surreal are opera's daily bread, whereas everyday speech acts like making small talk or ordering takeout have a strong tendency to go wonky. The more normal a speech act would be in real life, the more likely it is to sound absurd or unintentionally funny in opera. A world whose atmosphere is made of music is automatically a dream world, and within this world, what is communicated tends to have the unguardedness, the childlike directness of dream speech. It makes perfect sense in opera to lucidly reveal long buried traumas, to confess to shameful desires, to utter curses, prayers, prophecies, wordless primal cries. If they're done right, a listener can take all these things very seriously. An earnest in-depth debate about healthcare on the other hand would make no sense at all. There is a thriving YouTube subgenre of musicians setting speeches by public figures, often politicians, to music. In some cases, simply playing an instrument along with the unfortunate orator's speech patterns, a note for every syllable, carefully tracing the voice's implied pitches as it rises and falls. This is usually more than sufficient to make the speaker sound ridiculous. Why? Because in music's parallel universe, to talk about tax policy or congressional gridlock is to spew incomprehensible nonsense. Since these utterances are unlikely to have inspired music in the first place, they sound ridiculous when set to music. The third law of gravity, opera transforms pain into pleasure. In opera, happiness is not only a sad song, but also frequently a song of madness or blind bloodthirsty rage. The whole art form depends on music's power to make pain bearable or even pleasurable, both to the listener and the participating artists. As W.H. Auden put it, the singer may be playing the part of a deserted bride who is about to kill herself, but we feel quite certain as we listen that not only we, but the singer herself is having a wonderful time. The ramifications of this power are complex and ethically murky. The line between empathy and voyeurism is an unstable one, and part of the uneasy pleasure of listening to opera arises from a pervasive subliminal uncertainty. Am I empathizing with my fellow human beings or am I voyeuristically relishing someone else's pain? This ambiguity is a salient feature of opera's foundational story, the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. Music's power to transform pain into pleasure is this myth's central subject. But it's not clear whether Orpheus wields this power for good or evil. Orpheus's backward look is opera's original sin. By looking back, he subconsciously chooses the pleasures of lamentation, 
over the possibility of saving his wife. And though this dynamic is at its most mercilessly distilled in the Orpheus story, it's present to some degree in every opera. Hey, Garth. <laughs> hey, Matt. Hi, thank you so much for that. And thank you to everybody who's here for joining us um, for this conversation about my favorite topic, the impossibility of opera. Um, so Matt and I have never met in real life, um, but I feel close to him, close to you, um, because in some ways, I think we have charted similar and similarly winding paths. So my first education in art was in music, and in some ways, I feel like I'm still trying to do music in literature. And I think of you as an intensely literary composer. And in some way, I guess this is probably true of all opera, but maybe more intensely for a few composers um, like Verdi and Benjamin Britten and you um, doing literature in music. Um, we have one point of contact, at least one point of contact in our past, uh, what I suspect was a formative contact for both of us, um, which is that we were both students of the great poet Jory Graham, um, who has praised your poems online on Twitter, making me eager to see them. I wanted to start by asking you whether your experience making poems and your engagement with literature more generally um, feeds into your composition, your way, and maybe especially um, how you think about composing for the voice. Mm. Yeah, it is so interesting that our, our paths kind of went like this in a way because you were at a conservatory as an undergraduate, as, as a singer, and I was not at a conservatory. I was getting an English degree, you know, studying with Jory. Um, yes is the short answer. The longer answer is, um, you know, I think that something that arose in my work with Jory is she always had this sense that <laughs> my poems just wanted to be pure music. They kept you know, they, they weren't really poems. They were, in, they were stuck in some closet. They needed to kind of shed the, the skin of the words themselves and, and leap into pure sound. And I'm not sure that was always the case, but I think she was right that um, my medium ultimately is sound. Um, uh, and I think if, you know, if you're a composer, you, you have to have respect for sound as a substance. But what I'm really grateful for is that those years uh, working with, with Jory and, and other teachers gave me a sense of language as a substance, as, as a material. Um, and that's something that is not taught to composers, even those who work with, work with the voice. You know, usually words are seen only kind of as a, as, as a, as a means, you know, the, the raw material for, for, for music. And I find it's very helpful to, to, to get a sense of, of the weight of them, the the their their own desires before you before you try to make them make them sing. Well, that's that's a terrific response, um, and in some ways, as a, I mean, many connections with how I think about writing sentences in prose as well. I was going to say, I think you you know, your writing sometimes wants to be music too. I think in a really productive way. <laughs> it's beautiful. That's yeah, I think that's true. Um, so I, I want to ask a question that's pretty formless and um, is at least two questions and maybe more. So I'm just going to put some ideas out there and you take whatever you want and run with them. But I wanted to talk a little bit about intimacy, which is one of the through lines of the book. And I think maybe in a way um, that might be a little counterintuitive. Um, so you emphasize again and again your sense of opera as an intimate art. Um, I think for a lot of people, maybe whose ideas about opera come from like Zeffirelli spectacles, um, that might seem an odd claim to make. So the first of the two questions is what do you mean when you talk about the intimacy of opera? And then approaching intimacy from a different direction, um, one of the most compelling claims you make, arguments you make in the book for me um, about the uniqueness of opera, like what it adds to the technologies of attempting to explore and express humanness 
is opera's ability to convey multiple psychologies at the same time. Um, your book ends with a really gloriously beautiful chapter on Nozze di Firo, um, in which you talk about Mozart's ability to externalize in music what you call, this is a quote, the sum total of the spiritual energy in the room. I wondered if you could talk about those two aspects of opera, which are really maybe the same thing, how opera is an intimate experience of others' interiorities. Yeah, there are, there are several questions in there and I wanna address them all. Um, yeah, I do mention in the book that sometimes if, if I'm speaking of my love of opera, occasionally I'll get the sense that my interlocutor's eyes have kind of glazed over when I talk about the intimacy that is so essential to it, because you know, if they've just seen the Zeffirelli turn dot, you know, and their sense of opera is, you know, three hundred people on a stage with these giant columns and gilded snakes and confetti falling, you know, it's a, it, it's not intimate. But um, you know, the core of opera is is this this very organic mode of sound production. It is channeling the body and magnifying the body. Um, in a way that I find uh, breathtaking, in part because I, you know, I can't really do it myself. I'm not a singer. Um, there's this wonderful concept in opera of a, a pianissimo that carries, you know, a, a very soft sound, a soft dynamic that nonetheless can be heard in the upper balcony of, of the Metropolitan Opera. For me, that's one of the essential things in the art form. How do you create a pianissimo that carries? How do you create this illusion, which is this, this, this very intimate sound uh, that nonetheless is capable of filling a, 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 a huge space? I think about that also as a composer, that I want my gestures to be pianissimo, but, but, but resonant. Um, and I think it does sort of boil down to uh, the, the fact that you know, the sound is not being processed. You're not, it's not auto-tuned. It's very rarely amplified. Um, what you're hearing is vibrations of air in these chords within a person's throat. I mean, what could be more intimate than that? You're hearing kind of inside, um, in, inside of a human being. So that, that to me is kind of like a self-evident fact of the art form. And I think the, the, the sort of, grander and more grotesque uh, manifestations of it can, can blind people to that reality. Um, and to the, the second part of your question, this is, this is I suppose, more of a, a question for, the, for composers rather than you know, performers. But I, I do find that there's this kind of negative capability that is inherent in, in the art form because uh, in music, uh, layering of multiple psychological states or even events that are happening in different rooms or whatever does not necessarily lead to chaos. It can be constructive interference. Um, and this is something I found in my early conversations with the playwright Sarah Rule, the librettist of, of Eurydice, that that was one of the very few things that it took a while um, for her. She was incredibly her instincts were, were, were sensational as far as how to make a libretto, how to whittle a play down into a libretto. But one thing that took a while was this idea that there could be this intense simultaneity and you could have a couple of scenes that were at odds with each other layered. She was just kind of like, well, won't we just not get any of it? And I had to sort of say, well, I hate to tell you, you may not get the words, but you will get something that you couldn't get through words. <laughs> you know, you may have to kind of sacrifice the words onto the pyre um, for a few minutes, but I, I, I kind of promise it'll be worth it. And you mentioned the chapter on, on Nozze di Figaro. I, I, Mozart is for me the ultimate master of this because there's this sense always I find in his operas that um, the human being who is singing is experiencing one thing and then somewhere near the ceiling some voice in the orchestra is hovering like Puck or Ariel, um, this kind of attendant spirit that is going, is sort of maybe laughing at them, but also mm -hmm. laughing with love. You know, often it's the wind instruments that are kind of just there saying, oh, you know, you know, what fools they be, et cetera. Um, and I, I think that the miracle of it is, 
uh, it allows Mozart to be quite brutal about the the foibles, the flaws, the, the just the baseness of these people. But, but also there's some kind of, uh, redemption is too Wagnerian a word, but there's a kind of sense of forgiveness as well. And that happens in the in the orchestra. So that, that's what got me addicted to this art form. <laughs> yeah, well, and it does, I mean, I do, I, I felt reading your essay on Nozze di Figaro that it kind of clarified for me something that had always been my experience of opera, but that I had never articulated before. And it also seems to me that it is one of the impossibilities of opera to have this kind of spiritual x-ray of a group of people or to have, I mean, always a kind of potential for or promise of um, a kind of diverse, variously broken community coming to some kind of harmony that we can perceive and hear. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about impossibility, which is obviously kind of the, the, the sort of um, organizing principle of the book. And Nell talked a little bit about some of the impossibilities of opera that, that you talk about. But I wondered whether, I'm especially interested in your sense of productive impossibilities. And I wanted to ask whether, um, whether there's a way in which um, impossibility is not only productive, but necessary for art making. And if so, what that kind of impossibility is and why that might be. Uh, fabulous question. <laughs> um, there's the kind of banal but very real uh, impossibility of uh, just mechanically bringing certain pieces to life. I talk about this this opera by Harrison Birtwistle, The Mask of Orpheus, that seems kind of perversely engineered to thwart any attempt to bring it to the state. It's a giant orchestra, but there are no strings. So like who wants to pay for all the extra, you know, there's all this electronics. Each character is portrayed by three different people, a singer, a, a mime and a dancer, you know, there's multiple conductors. Um, that's an extreme case, but you know, the ring cycle is also an extreme case. There, there, there are any number of things that just, you look at the, the, the the sort of horsepower that is required to to all for what for for a single performance you know that a few hundred or a few thousand people are going to see um, there's that level which you know I find it fascinating too that the art form endures that people continue to um, dedicate what seems like outsized effort um, to these sort of fleeting um, uh, unlikely events but I also think there's a way in which you can you can read most operas through the impossible thing that they tried to do and and failed to do. Um, it's it's super present in the in the first generation in the Monteverdi and Perry and all these people that you know their ideal is kind of fidelity to an art form that they'd never experienced. Like what? Like it's a really it's a fascinating thing. They seem to have taken it perfectly seriously that you know we are resurrecting the modes of declamation and this synthesis. I was like, they didn't know. How could you, how could any of us have known? Um, it's this thing of, you know, it's kind of the supreme fiction, right? You know, you construct this thing that you're not gonna, that you, you can't really make, but you end up making something um, <laughs> that has all these other qualities. Um, and I do think that as, as you suggested, uh, this might be inherent in all art making. The reason I'm interested about it in opera is that it's so much more egregious and like often embarrassing and obvious um, uh, it, it, because there are so many moving parts. And also there are these mysterious things like I, I, I quote Auden repeatedly in the book because he's just such, he, he's endlessly quotable on this subject, but he talks about, you know, a performance of I think Bellini's Norma um, where you know the the set fell over in the middle of it, and you could see stage hands scurrying backstage, and he kind of said, and it didn't matter at all <laughs> that there's something about the the texture of the art form and its unreality that nothing it it somehow didn't break the spell. Or you think about poor Deborah Voigt falling off the set in the opening right. night of the Ring Cycle, yeah, and again also somehow doesn't really matter. Um, 
Um, so before I, I turn to my next question, I just want to remind everyone, we are going to save 15 or 20 minutes at the end for your questions. Please don't wait until then. Um, you can put them in the chat box at any, or in the, sorry, in the Q&A box. The chat box is closed, I think, but the Q&A box at any point. So please do that. Don't wait for the very end. Um, you So you were talking just a minute ago about the embarrassing aspects of opera, the embarrassment of opera. And I wanted to talk a little bit um, about the moral embarrassment that you mentioned in the section that you read at the very beginning. Um, so your new opera, of course, is Eurydice, or the, the opera that's being performed now at the Met, um, which is a retelling of the Orpheus myth. And you write a lot about Orpheus in the book. He's kind of a main character of the book. Um, I'm interested in how you see Orpheus as emblematic of a kind of moral problem, or at least of a moral tension. So um, in the pages that you read, you say that Orpheus is looking back is opera's original sin. And you say a little later that the Orpheus myth makes clear, quote, the perils of narcissism and aestheticism. Orpheus seems more at home singing elegies for Eurydice than he is actually living with her, unquote. So I wondered if you could talk about that tension, maybe talk about it, how you explored it as you were writing the opera, and maybe more generally about how that moral tension animates all art that's made out of grief, all art that's made out of reality, and Really, I wonder um, whether there's a kind of inescapable moral quandary to making art at all. And if there is, if one has to sacrifice a kind of um, sense of one's own moral unimpeachableness or one's own moral purity to make art, why do we do it? <laughs> oh, the big question. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh... I think you know if you look at the structure of of most Orpheus operas, it's it's quite an unusual uh, way to build a work of theater because basically it, it, it tends to start with Eurydice's first death. Uh, it's it's a loss, and then there's a lot of voluptuous grieving that Orpheus gets to indulge in, and then there's a second death. I mean, there's an attempted rescue first, and then there she dies again and he gets to grieve all over again. So basically, instead of the usual, you know, Aristotelian ideas of, 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 of dramatic structure, it's like death, mourning, death, mourning. And that's basically it. Um, and I just think that is opera boiled down um, to its essence in a certain way, because it's always about loss as an excuse for music making. It's just that in that story, it's literal. Um, uh, so I think it's it's been it's been kind of catnip uh, for for many composers. Uh, as a result, I, I also think that it's important that in, in that story, there is a person Eurydice who is usually effaced. You know, I think part of what makes the story feel a little bit icky in some tellings is that it's ostensibly all about Eurydice and his love for her. But if that were the case wouldn't we see a bit more of them as lovers? You know, it often these operas barely feature that there are not any great love scenes in, in Gluck or Monteverdi, you know, they barely speak to each other usually. Um, so there's this sense that someone, is, someone has been invented merely to be, you know, killed off and, and lamented over. And I don't think that is true of every story, you know, that there, there are, um, there are other ways of engaging with the Orphic dynamic than inventing a sort of straw man lover. You know? so, um, and for me, th there is an important, though hard to define difference between um, you know, uh, uh, emotional manipulation and genuine revelation. You know, I've, I've, Puccini, much as I admire him, is a bit of a manipulator, I think. <laughs> um, so it's, it, it, it's, it's very tricky. I mean, to the question of why we, why we do this in spite of, of these, these perils. I, I think it, it's, it's, for me, it's out of a hope uh, that it's possible to invite others in to these experiences. It's, 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 a, it's a hope 
I think, you know, when you, when you write music and then you hand it to a singer or you share it with an audience, you're kind of saying, I felt this, do you feel it too? I heard this, do you, do you, is it this way for you too? Um, and I really do, I think I've based my whole artistic life on that possibility of, of shared experience as opposed to the, 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 the merely narcissistic thing of um, effacing another for the sake of my own experience. But, you know, it, it's not ultimately for me to say whether I've ever succeeded in that. So it's, it's, it's a risky business. <laughs> You know, that that sets up so beautifully my next question, which is about collaboration. But I wanted mm. I want to sort of follow up and ask whether you think, because I wondered this as I was reading the book and especially the section on Whitman, um, whether there is something in your imagination that responds to um, a kind of suspicion, um, a kind of moral suspicion. So your first opera, Crossing. Um, is about Whitman and especially about Whitman's, um, the time that he spent nursing the Civil War wounded. And you bring a kind of, in a similar way as you do to Orpheus, you know, oh, this, this beautiful music is just, you know, but maybe it's just a kind of narcissism. You bring a similar kind of moral skepticism or suspicion to Whitman and to his motivation for being um, for taking care of these men. Do you think there's something to that? I mean, is there something that you find interesting in sort of that project of kind of moral skepticism or suspicion? Yeah, evidently I do. <laughs> I think you're totally right. I think that there's there's a real likeness there. I mean, I, I, I was attracted to working with Whitman because there's uh, there's kind of this extraordinary historical panorama of, of, of the, this unstable moment for America, as well as um, this kind of unique artistic project that he had undertaken. Um, and I do think my, my thoughts about Whitman continue to evolve. I think in the chapter I say, you know, maybe I was a bit hard on him in the, in the opera, because you reread the, the, the diaries and it's like, you know, the guy did drop everything and work as a volunteer for, for years. And I, I don't think you can efface that. But, you know, the, another, a writer friend after reading that chapter sent me some uh, horrible, you know, stuff that Whitman wrote in a pamphlet, you know, really xenophobic, racist, like stuff that it really feels, you know, so it's, it's never over, you know, the, the, this process of, of, of reconsidering it. Um, so yes, I think I am attracted to, 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 to protagonists that can embody this tension. Um, with Whitman, it was also appealing that it was, it was, it was part of a really dynamic, um, yeah, political historical moment that seemed ripe for, for dramatization. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, and then moving on to the sort of desire for shared experience. Um, so writing novels is an intensely private act. And so I'm both like really attracted to and titillated by and utterly horrified by the kinds of collaboration that are required by an art like opera. So I feel like I would be paralyzed by dread at if I knew that sort of the very grounds of my art depended on the cooperation of in opera, potentially hundreds of other people. But in the book, you write movingly about um, what you think of as the miracles made possible by communal music making. So I wanted, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about opera as community building and maybe about some of the communities that have supported and continue to support your own work. Yeah, this is, this is a great question. I, I, I think I'm gonna start by saying that, you know, uh, I think I'm, I'm much farther on the, the kind of uh, spectrum of collaboration uh, in in the direction of collaboration that than than you are as a novelist, Garth. But I'm by no means at the other extreme. I had a really interesting meeting a few years ago. Uh, I was in Los Angeles and I got to know some of the folks at Disney, and I, I met with some of the the directors of some of the great, you know, like I think The Lion King, like the great Disney animated films. And we were talking about our processes, and these folks were shocked to learn that I basically sat alone and wrote the opera myself. Because for them, it is uh, always a room full of people and they do these kind of fascinating uh, 
primal you know, screening processes where they bring a hundred people into a, into a room and screen an early version and they take down their kind of gut responses and they boil those responses down to this kind of id, you know, this collective id response. Um, and they're making their artistic decisions based on that. And I was of course a little bit horrified you know, I can't go that far. <laughs> um, of course, there are hundreds of millions of dollars riding on those projects, so it's an entirely different ecosystem. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, I am often paralyzed with dread uh, in a in a workshop or in a performance. It's really it, it's it's really intense, both because you're you're self conscious about your work, but also, um, as you said whether your work is even recognizable as your work does depend on the accuracy of a, of, of, of a, of a lot of, of performers. Um, uh, I, I like to say, you know, thinking of a good line uh, in a novel or in a poem is every bit as difficult as thinking of a good musical line, but at least in the case of novels and poems, you write it down and it's done. There it is, you know, that's it. Uh, for me, it's kind of the beginning of the process. So um, uh, I'm in the middle of, of this production at, at, at the Met and I we just had our HD broadcast on Saturday. The Met has a, 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 a series that's broadcast to cinemas around the world. And I bring it up because it was just one of those days when I was so, like I was moved to tears by this village of people performing the piece because, you know, I couldn't have done any of their jobs for them. I couldn't have sung, I couldn't have played most of the instruments, I couldn't have directed the show, I couldn't have dealt with the tech the way that the those, you know, wizardly met stage technicians do. So for me, that's kind of what makes it worth it. You know, you have to endure weeks or months of thinking this sounds like crap, this is not what I wrote, this is, this is just not it. And then when it does appear as the thing, um, it's like you know an eclipse or some ex vanishingly rare <laughs> cosmic event. But I have to say, on those days, um, it, it 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 does feel worth it. So, <laughs> no, that's that's terrific. You know, those Met broadcasts are so extraordinary. I remember I took a group of students to see Peter Grimes and Sofia Bulgaria. Like it's just amazing that you can go to a movie theater you know, in these cities around the world and see great performances of opera from New York. I remember going to exactly that broadcast uh, meant in a very different city. So yeah, it is extraordinary. Yeah, it's really great. Um, so I have one final formal question for you. So again, um, it looks like we have some questions coming in, but I want to encourage everybody to drop your questions in the Q&A box, because um, after this, we're going to turn the floor to you guys. Um, but so, when I was studying to be an opera singer, um, I was very strongly aware um, that in the minds of many people, I was looking to devote my life to a dying art form. When I switched to, lyric, to studying lyric poetry, um, I often suspected the same. And from what I hear, it is also true that the novel is dying. So you know, it's just a life devoted to sort of the dying arts. But in your book, you make another claim that I think many of us might find counterintuitive. You want to claim that we actually are living in a golden age of opera. And um, here's another quote from you. You say, quote, I've come to believe that opera has the potential to be a strong countercultural force rather than a feeble mainstream one. And you talk about opera as potentially a field of resistance and experimentation. So can you talk a little bit about um, in what ways how you think of opera being a strong countercultural force or potentially a strong countercultural force and maybe more generally about what you see as being the state of opera today? Yeah, I mean, this is this may be a crude analogy. Certainly, it's an incomplete one. But I also talk in the book about uh, opera and classical music more broadly, many forms of classical music, not just Western classical music, as being a bit like organically uh, cooked <laughs> foods. You know, you're 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 channeling the body's power. Um, in a more immediate way than uh, the many kinds of processed sound. Um, and and we're, we're used to engaging with sound through electronic processing these days. And for me, it's, it's very much the same as processing food. 
Um, and so I do think of this kind of fixation on these ancient techniques of cultivating um, musical power through the body as being an alternative that uh, will always be a subculture. It will always be a niche because the um, means of production pre uh, prevent it from being mass produced. You know, it's it's never going to out Hollywood, Hollywood. It's never going to out Bruce Springsteen, Bruce Springsteen. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's dying. It means that it's a resource um, and and a refuge for anyone who want who needs it, who wants to turn to it. Um, and I do also think you know that that's one analogy. Another though is that you know a, a lot of uh, composers, sound artists um, that are working kind of underground uh, below the, the 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 radar of of the mainstream even the kind of modest mainstream of classical music itself, you know, they're doing things formally um, and sonically that just would never fly in, in popular music or, and, and, and it, you know, I mean, six or seven hour pieces, you know, experiments in um, sustaining a, a single tone beyond what would seem humanly possible. I mean, things that are kind of opening up new fields of experience. Um, and I think that's really vital work. And it's not normally something we associate with the word opera, but but this work is happening. And one thing that I really hope the book does is kind of just make more people aware that it's happening. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think that, Supporting that kind of work is really essential, but more essential for me than um, supporting operas that would prefer to be Broadway musicals, because I think there are other venues, there are other modes for, for that kind of work. So, yeah. I feel a similar way about literary novels that seem to aspire to be Netflix miniseries. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so hurrah for countercultural counter forces. Okay, so um, we have several questions and the one I wanna start with is very boots on the ground practical. Mm -hmm. And it is, what would be a good entry point for people who are either new to opera or who might be intimidated by the genre or the art form? So yeah, like how do you get people to jump on sort of the big yellow school bus of opera? I mean, I do think these these live and HD broadcasts are potentially a, a, a good place to start because the um, th the way that you experience the sound is is really carefully um, curated. Um, you you hear things very clearly and you see things very clearly. And I think that you know seeing things live in a big opera house was probably the the last word in spectacle in the 18th and 19th centuries, but it's not the last word in spectacle today. So it can be a bit of an alienating experience. So I would say a, a, a broadcast, a recording that you uh, that you get out of the library or you you go you go on Spotify and you find the words online um, and you follow along and you kind of get a good pair of headphones and immerse yourself in it. Um, I think the best first encounter of all though is hearing a wonderful singer and you know instrumentalists in a small room, in somebody's living room, uh, in a barn, in, in kind of an informal, but, but ideally small setting so that you feel the sound in your rib cage um, and you have a bodily experience of it. Um, uh, that to me is, is, is really essential. I feel like you may have also been asking, um, I don't know who, who asks, ah, it's anonymous. anonymous. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, I'm not sure um, if you were looking for specific piece recommendations, um, but maybe we can maybe we can deal with that later. <laughs> well, what would you, I mean? Do you have like a, a the number one opera you would recommend for somebody who's not already convinced? Gosh, I really should, shouldn't I? I mean, um, I think if you. I, I would be tempted to say the Verdi Shakespeare operas because people tend to know the Shakespeare plays and and uh, if you can if you can sit through a play you can definitely sit through those operas they're actually condensed rather than expanded um, I also uh, you mentioned Peter Grimes I think that's a that's a great one uh, it's a wonderful English language opera that is both 
you know, I, I don't like the word accessible because I think these pieces access us more than we access them, um, but it's kind of a tidal wave and it's in very clear English. Wow. So those are a couple of places I would start. And I would, I would offer a vote for that Met production, which you can get on DVD, um, which uh, in which Peter Grimes is played by Anthony Dean Griffey, who was a, a fellow student of my voice teacher at the Eastman School, um, and who I think sings it gloriously, like just absolutely gloriously. Um, there's a really interesting question that I would be fascinated to hear you respond to, but it's gonna depend on how familiar you are with a piece that I'm not familiar about. So, or I'm not familiar with. So you've reinterpreted the Orpheus myth in your opera. Can you speak to your reaction to the effort by Wayne Shorter and Esperanza Spalding, who's a singer I love, um, to reinterpret Iphigenia? And in some ways, I guess, to reinterpret the central rules of opera itself. Is that something you can speak to? Are you familiar with that work? Alas, I can't because it just, it just, just, just had its premiere. Um, I believe it had a workshop performance at Mass Mocha in Western Mass, which ironically is, you know, within 15 minutes of where I live in Vermont. Um, but I was here in New York when it when it happened. I'm a huge fan of Wayne Shorter and Esperanza Spalding, so I'm I'm deeply curious, but I can't speak to it yet. Okay, all right. I'll be. I'm super interested to look that up too. Um, that's not not anything I was that was on my radar. Um, so there's a question about the uh, librettist and composer working together. And you, as you've mentioned, you worked with a very brilliant playwright, also FSG author um, Sarah Rule. So um, this question: How do the librettist and the composer, whether this is one person or two, collaborate? Does one I assume music or words come first. Is one fire and the other firewood? Um, there is a chapter in the book called "The Firewood and the Fire" about um, Igor Stravinsky and Auden's relationship and, and, and collaboration on the rake's progress. Um, I hate to say it, but I do think the words are kind of the firewood <laughs> in this in this equation. Um, the, the words certainly come first. I mean, I think the libretto functions very much like the screenplay in a movie you know you need it before the before the filming happens you know the, the libretto is the screenplay and the music is more or less everything else the the, the cinematography the um and it's and it's the bones um as far as the the process um sarah's and my process on eurydice was was probably um smoother and happier than than many uh, because we were adapting an extant play that uh, I felt was already quite close to being a libretto. It was not like adapting a Shakespeare play where you have to throw out 85% of the play if you don't want your opera to be 10 hours long. In the case of Eurydice, we probably kept 60%, 70% uh, of, of the original play, and it was just a matter of, of whittling things down. Um, you know, the way it worked practically was in some cases, Sarah would say, you take a crack at that scene. You just, you cut what you need to cut and tell me what sings and doesn't sing. And in other cases, I would, I would let her do the, do the reduction. Um, and then usually I would get stuck somewhere and give her a call and she would have one kind of luminous, perfect suggestion that would unlock something. Um, and, and, you know, that was, that was basically it. Um, it, we didn't make any extremely radical changes except for the addition of the character of Orpheus's double. I had this idea that Orpheus needed to be portrayed by two singers, kind of embodying his split nature, a baritone and a countertenor. Um, there's no uh, analogy, there's no uh, corollary for that, that in the play. Um, but I'm afraid, you know, it's 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 fairly it's fairly boring answer. But we we whittled it down, and it was a libretto. That was it was it was pretty easy. Um, so I'm very excited to see this name in the chat. Uh, the great singer, whom you know very well, Barry Banks, um, Barry. Has, asked, asked a question. Barry writes, um, and also um, stealing scenes, I guess, in Eurydice. The reviews have been extraordinary. Oh, yes. <laughs> for Barry Banks. Um, so you said that you endure week, this is Barry, you said that you endure weeks of thinking, this isn't what I wrote, it sounds like crap. And he says he's paraphrasing. 
how do you get over this and how do you approach the people doing your work to turn this around, I guess, to turn from crap to, oh no, this is actually some version of that thing I had hoped to make. And then <laughs> there's the dreaded parentheses, which is, or do you, do you manage to turn that around? <laughs> well, I have said, so Barry is a phenomenal tenor who is singing the, 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 the leading role of Hades in Eurydice right now and 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 we've worked together quite closely on on, on on the opera. I should say that when I when I'm thinking oh this sounds like crap usually it's because of what I wrote it's not it's not just it's not my collaborator. Um, you know I, I do try to uh, approach it by kind of getting my hands dirty uh, as a performer. I do also conduct and, and play piano and um, you know maybe it's my early years playing jazz and 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 other kinds of music as well, but the the idea of a of a clean divide between composer and performer um, has never made a, a ton of of sense to me. So I find that the way to approach it is to really do it together with your collaborators, because usually um, you you feel. Um, you feel physically what works and doesn't in terms of where does this note sit in their voice? Like, is it is it just too too difficult, too painful? What should the pacing be? You know, how much freedom should there be? I do think it helps to to actually be doing it as opposed to just sitting back. You know, there were some some fascinating moments. Uh, the production of Eurydice is is being conducted by the Met's music director Yannick Neze Seguin, who's been an incredible collaborator. Um, and there were a couple of really fascinating moments where he came up to me and said, could I take this tempo a little bit differently here? Like, could I, could I do X thing? And, I, and it turned out to be something that had been my original idea, but that I had changed through experience. Where he'd said, what if I took, what if I do this tempo change here? And in one case, Barry, this is actually at your entrance when you, when you appear and say hello on a high B. Um, uh, Yannick had said, can I do the tempo change a couple bars earlier? And I had said, I, that was what I originally wanted to do, but I actually experienced what it was like to do that and decided to move it. So anyway, this is probably minutia that's not so interesting for non-performers, but I guess the short answer is I try to be in the trenches <laughs> with you guys um, so that I can feel what's working and not working. Yeah, so that's a wonderfully practical answer. And a lot of the questions are practical and um, get into the nitty gritties and wonderful, wonderfully boots on the ground. But there's one that is more expansively philosophical. And I wondered if we might take a crack at that. So thinking about how earlier we were talking about the possibility that impossibility might be inherent in all art making, there's a question that says, if the arts are an expression of our humanness, what might the impossibility of opera teach us about our collective human experience? I'm glad I get to ask you that question instead of having to try to think of something to say in response. I'm not seeing, can you repeat the question, Garth? It's so big, I wanna make sure I really hear. So, okay. So, if the arts are an expression of our humanness, what might the impossibility of opera teach us about our collective human experience? Mm. I, I think this is actually, a, a, it's a question that's already making me think in, in kind of a new way um, because the endeavor of putting on any kind of large scale production does have similarities to, you know, rallying big groups of people together for other kinds of causes, whether political, social, what, what, whatever, what have you. Um, uh, and I think there is the similarity that uh, things never go as planned, and and you when when you find yourself in the thick of it, you you sometimes think, oh well, has the mission changed? Do I still recognize this? Um, sometimes that can be bad, um, but sometimes when it's going well, I find that it it reveals something about uh, collective. Um, I don't want to say decision making, but yeah, collective action. Um, the, the 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 more generous way of looking at it is um, that when you actually engage in large scale collective action, um, 
you discover that the thing you're doing isn't what you expected, but is maybe even more important. Um, when it doesn't come together, <laughs> I think it's probably self-evident that it, it, it just reveals the difficulties of, of, uh, of large-scale cooperation. Like I said, it's, it's like witnessing an eclipse when it, when it all does come together. You know, I don't know if you've read that book, Homo Sapiens, um, that's been on the bestseller list for like five years. The, the Harari book? That's right, yeah. Yeah, I have. So in that, you know, he talks about, I think it's in that book, um, it, that he talks about sort of how um, Neanderthals had boats, like they had the necessary technology to cross the ocean, mm. but they never did. And then Homo sapiens did. And the question of what is the difference sort of between Neanderthal and Homo sapiens that causes one but not the other to want to sort of cast out into the impossible abyss of the ocean. And it seems to me that like in some ways opera might epitomize that aspect of humanness, which is, you know, sort of the source of everything, you know, miraculous about human beings and also everything horrifying about human beings, this sort of need to, this urge for more you know, um, in some that's required is really astonishing because no one knows exactly how anybody else's job works. We're all just trusting that they all, everyone knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I think that's really, that's a really beautiful comparison. Well, so maybe as a final question, there's another wonderfully concrete question, um, which is if you could play one role in an opera, all constraints gone, what would you take on? That's a great question. You see, this is from Sarah Darling. Hi, Sarah, um, a wonderful fellow musician. Um, I think I would be Lulu in, in Berg's opera Lulu, uh, sort of the, 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 the femme fatale of the 20th century. It's sort of the opera that is, embodies the kind of catastrophes of the, of the European 20th century. Um, and you know, I, I, my friend, the soprano Marlis Peterson is a great Lulu. And I, I was in New York when she was singing what she announced would be her last production in, in 2015. And I, I kind of asked her why she was retiring it at the top of her game. And she said, you know, Matthew, I was a little bit afraid I was becoming Lulu. You know, in other words, a, a murderous, you know, uh, a, a, a murderous, Flying Dutchman esque wanderer, um, but it's 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 pretty irresistible. So, I was at that production too, and it was really electrifying. But I have to say, I was I'm surprised by that answer. So thank you for <laughs> ending the conversation by surprising me. Um, great. Hi, Nell. Hi. That was the best answer you could have <laughs> possibly. Thank you. That was perfect. I <laughs> Um, uh, thank you so much to both of you. I am so, I don't want to cut this short so much. I could just hear you both talk about the subject for hours, but, um, uh, I can't. So <laughs> thank you all of you for joining us. Uh, and again, I've posted links in the chat to purchase the impossible art from Harvard bookstore. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, thanks again to uh, Garth and Matthew. This was uh, really wonderful. Thank you so much. I feel very lucky that Garth is my interlocutor. I'm sure you all know his work, but if you don't, come on, like get yeah. with the program. <laughs> Buy his books. Entirely my pleasure. Thank you so much, you guys. All right. Have a good evening. Thank you.